Hello everybody. Uh, today's topic uh, are going to be confidence intervals. Uh, in particular, uh, we are going to look at the definition of a confidence interval. Then we are going to see how we can calculate the confidence interval for a mean. And note that well, we will be distinct, uh, make the distinction between uh, two cases. The first case is the variance of the population is known. Note that this is a very unrealistic case, but I'm still going to use it because I can explain the basic concept of a confidence interval. And then we are going to look at the second case, the more realistic one, where the population variance is, uh, is actually unknown and we have to estimate it. We are then going to move on to the confidence interval for a proportion. A proportion means that Suppose you want to calculate the number of people who are going to vote for the Democratic candidate. That would be a proportion. And then finally, we are going to look at sample size calculations. And we are going to look at a calculation of a sample size if the population is infinite or very large. And the calculation of the sample size if the population is, uh, is finite. For this exercise, we are going to use uh, two data files that are necessary, and you can download them on Canvas. And the first data file is called gss.csv, which contains data from the General Social Survey, and we are going to focus on the year 2018. And the second data file is called uh, meridianhills2.csv, which contains data about housing values in the uh, Meridian Hills area. Okay, so the confidence interval is basically a range of values that is based on a sample such that the population param parameter, that means either the mean or the pr proportion, is occurring within that range with a certain probability alpha. And we will see in the future that this probability alpha is usually 95%. Uh, sometimes it is 90% and sometimes it can also be 99, uh, 99%. But in most cases, it's 95%. We will see that the confidence interval is going to be a point estimate. Think about the point estimate as taking the average of the sample data plus a margin of error. Now, to put the confidence interval in a slightly different perspective, or explain it slightly differently, is that suppose you have a population and you take 100 different samples from that population. And then you're constructing a confidence interval as outlined in the, uh, in the future slides. And in 95% of those cases, the confidence interval will actually contain the true population mean or the true population proportion. Note that the population parameters, i.e. the mean or the uh, proportion, will never be known. Okay? We will see that the confidence interval is influenced by three factors. The sample size, which we will call n, the population standard deviation sigma. Note that very often we have to estimate that population standard deviation by using, uh, by using s, and also the level of confidence, meaning if it's 95%, 90%, or 99%. Recall that the difference between the sigma and the standard and the estimated uh, sample variance s is that in one case we divide by n minus n, and in the case of s we are dividing by n minus one. Okay, so first look at the confidence interval for the mean. The components for any confidence interval involving the mean are two things: the sample size. So you have to know of how many observations do you actually have in your sample. And you also have to calculate the sample mean. On the previous slide, I called the sample mean a point estimate. Think about this if, you're, if you are interested in the starting salary for MPA students. You take the average of all the MPA students that have graduated from the O'Neill School, and you calculate the average. That would be a point estimate of the sample mean. Now, the components, depending on what we know about the population, uh, about the standard deviation of the population, 
actually determines of how we calculate this confidence interval. If we know what the population standard deviation is, then we take we can we take the sigma and we can also use what is called the z value for a given confidence interval. Note that the z value is based on the normal distribution. If we do not know anything about the population standard deviation, or if that population standard deviation is unknown, then we have to estimate it first based on our sample. And this is where we are going to use the um, sample standard deviation or the sample variance, which is calculated by uh, dividing by n minus one. And if the unknown, if the population standard deviation is unknown, we cannot use the normal distribution to calculate the z value for a given confidence level, but we have to calculate what is called a t value for a given confidence level. The t value is based on the student's distribution or the, the t distribution. And I will, uh, I will explain what the difference is between a normal and the t distribution soon. To calculate the confidence interval for the mean, we have to do the following. We first have to calculate the average sample. Uh, have to calculate the average of our um, of our uh, in our sample. Then we have to use the population standard deviation, which we may know, and we have to divide by the square root of n. Now let me explain what this z value means here. As you remember from the last lecture, we have what is called uh, we have the what is called the central limit theorem, which says that if you randomly sample from a population, if you're taking multiple samples, then the average of that of the sample means is go going to follow the uh, normal distribution. Okay, so if we draw a normal distribution here. So here we have our bell-shaped curve. Then we have we have the mean here, or we call this uh, mu. Then we said that the the area, the entire area under this curve, is equal to one. Okay. Now for the uh, for the normal distribution or for the standard normal distribution. Remember that the standard normal distribution has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay. Then what this means is if the if the mean is equal to zero and the standard deviation is one, then it turns out that we can we have a value here of negative one point nine six and we have a value here of one point nine six and those two values, those two bounds, what they do is they leave 2.5% of the entire mass of the distribution to the left, and they leave 2.5% of the entire mass of the distribution to the right here. Okay? So note that we now have what we have also then in the middle is we have 95%. Okay? So 95% is the rest of this entire area here. Okay. Now, note that this 95% is going to play a very important role because remember that we are going to construct confidence intervals usually based on the 95%. And you will also see that the values of negative 1. Uh, of 
and negative 1.96 are going to play a very important role in uh, constructing confidence interval, intervals and then also in the future in constructing um, or in conducting uh, conducting hypothesis tests. Okay. So in the case of the confidence interval for the mean, we will see that this z value here, if you want to construct a 95% confidence interval, that this z value is going to be 1.96, okay, which corresponds to the negative 1.96 and the 1.96 here, okay. And I will explain why we have it, uh, why we are going to use a negative and positive here in a minute. Okay. Okay, so now let's do a more practical application here. So assume that you have the American Economic Association, which is the main association for, uh, for economists, that they want to construct a 95% confidence interval for the starting salaries of economics majors. Okay, so those are uh, undergraduates. And suppose that they're sampling 36 people that recently graduated and they calculate the sample mean, and that sample mean is $48,500. Now assume, for whatever reason, that they know that the population standard deviation is $3,500. Okay. Then they are taking the point estimate of the starting salary, which is the $48,500. They are adding the plus or minus 1.96. Note that this represents plus or minus 1.96 represents the 95%, the bounds to the 95% area in the middle of the, uh, of the standard normal distribution. They multiply it by the population standard deviation, 3,500, and divide it by, this, um, the, by the square root of the sample size n. This is what you're seeing in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this equation here. So what they get is, the 95% confidence interval, where they say $48,500 plus or minus $1,943. Okay. So as mentioned before, the value of 1.96 leaves 2.5% in, in each tail of the standard normal distribution. And so the $1,143 represents the margin of error. And the value of $583, which is simply the $3,500 divided by the square root of 36, which is 6, represents the standard error. Okay, so now this is an example where we assume that the standard population standard deviation is $3,500. Now, if you think about this, this is very unrealistic because it is more likely that you would actually know something about the population mean than the population standard deviation. However, it serves as a good introductory example of how we have to think about the value of 1.96 or this z value. Now, let's move to the much more realistic case where the standard deviation of the population is actually unknown. In that case, we actually have to estimate the standard deviation of the population by using s. Now, Remember that by using S, we are actually dividing by N minus 1. This matters if the sample size is small, but doesn't matter as much if the sample size is actually uh, very large. Now, the approach is very similar to the construction of the confidence interval when the uh, population standard deviation is known, that we have to divide by the, the estimate of the samples, the estimate of the uh, variance, or the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, but now we cannot use the z value anymore, but we have to use what is called the uh, uh, t value. Okay? Now, the t value is not based on the normal distribution, but is actually based on the t distribution or the student's distribution. So, just on a side note, the term student distribution comes from the fact that the person who actually invented this distribution or who came up with the distribution was working for the uh, brewery Guinness uh, in Ireland and the, his employer didn't allow him to uh, publish the paper under his real name, which was uh, William Gossett. 
So in order to publish the paper anyway, he actually just chose the name student to publish the paper and hence student distribution. Okay? Now, the student distribution is extremely similar to the normal distribution in the sense that the t-distribution is uh, continuous, it's symmetric, and it's also bell-shaped. And the shape of the function, or the shape of the distribution, actually depends on the, the what are called the degrees of freedom. And now let me go back to the hand note here and explain a little bit what we mean by degrees of freedom. Okay. So think about, I give you three values, say x1, x2, and x3. And I tell you that the average of this, those values is equal to 5. Okay. Now, suppose I ask you, well, what is the value of x1, x2, and x3 when the average of those three values is equal to 5? Well, I could say that x1 may be 7. I could tell you that x2 may be, I don't know, uh, 9. Now, I have picked those two values randomly. Now, knowing that the average is equal to 5, I know that the last value has to be equal to negative 1. Because if this wasn't equal to negative 1, we would not get an average of 5 based on those two previous values. So in this case, we have n or the number of observations is equal to 3. And the degrees of freedom, let's call it simply df, is actually equal to n minus 1, which is equal to 2 in this case. Okay. Think about this the following way. We have those three values, and we know what the average is, and we can pick, or we have the freedom, to pick two of those values, but we do not have the freedom to pick the last of those values. Hence, the degrees of freedom is equal to 2. Okay. Now, the t distribution depends on this value uh, that, are, that is called degrees of freedom. Okay. So it turns out, and I will do some illustrations later, soon, that for very large degrees of freedom, mathematically actually an infinite number of degrees of freedom, the t distribution is identical to the standard normal distribution. Now, the important aspect of the t distribution are the tails, which are weighted heavier. Now, here I have a graphical representation of how the t distribution compares to the normal distribution. Note that you have the normal distribution is the dotted line here. And you have the degrees of freedom, in this case very high, say 30. You see that it's very close to the normal distribution. However, if the degrees of freedom are very low, say 3 or even 1, then you see that the curve is slightly flatter and you actually have more weight, um, more weight in the tails. Okay, So you have more area in the tails. For a given value, you have more area in the tails than for the normal distribution. Now, think about it the following way. Let me get back to this, uh, to this unknown population variance. If we do not know the standard deviation of the population, we have to estimate it. And think about this estimation procedure to add an additional source of error that we could make in calculating those confidence intervals. And hence, in order to correct for this area, we actually have to widen the, uh, divide, widen the area of the confidence interval to account for this area. Okay? So let me, let me uh, de demonstrate this to you of how this actually works in, um, how this actually works in, uh, in practice here. Okay? Okay. So again, think about the, think about the normal distribution. 
Let's make this in red. And now, so in red, we have the normal distribution. And now let's take in blue, let's draw the T distribution for a small number or for a small value of the degrees of freedom. So we saw that it is slightly flatter. And it, it allocates more values, more weight to the tails. So what this means is as following. So take this value of 1.96 that we know from the standard normal distribution. And this value of 1.96 leaves 2.5% in this area for the normal distribution. Okay. Now, if you compare this to the T distribution, okay, so the, the blue line here is the T distribution, okay. so you can see now that for this exact same value of 1.96, We have additional area here. Okay. Note that the same, the same which is true in this on the on the right hand side. We also have the same being true on the left hand side. Okay. So for a given value, say if this is negative 1.96, okay, then for the normal distribution we have. 2.5% in this area here, but the T distribution for the same value actually has more, has more, um, has a higher probability or much more area in this area here. Okay. So what this means is, so what this means is the following: that if you want to construct a 95% confidence interval. And you don't know anything about the you don't know anything about the you don't know anything about the mean and you compare so you have the uh so you have the t distribution actually sorry um You have the t distribution here. So if you want to calculate a 95% confidence interval, then you cannot use the value of 1.96 because for the t distribution it would leave you more than 2.5% in this area here. But what you have to do is you actually have to move a little bit further to the to the right in this case. To get an area of 2.5%, 2.5% in here. Okay. So note that if you are moving to the right, this also gives you, in many cases, gives you a value over two. So your confidence interval is actually going to be a little bit larger than with the normal uh, than with the normal distribution. Okay. So the steps to construct actually the confidence interval for the mean if the population variance or the population standard deviation is unknown is as follows. You estimate the sample mean, which is x bar. You determine the degrees of freedom, and the degrees of freedom actually depend on the sample size, which is n minus 1, meaning if you have a sample size of uh, 36, then the degrees of freedom is actually 36 minus 1 is equal to 35. Okay, so note, if you remember from the previous slides, if your sample size gets very small, then you're having more and more area in this, you're having more and more areas in the area in the tail, and you're 
confidence interval is actually expanding or this t-value that you're using to construct the confidence interval is expanding. Okay? Now, based on the confidence interval that you're interested in and degrees of freedom, you have to determine the t-value. Okay? So, to determine the t-value for a 95% confidence interval, you can use R for this. And you can be just typing in uh, QT, parenthesis open, point, uh, 0 0.975, comma, and the degrees of freedom is equal to, say, 35, okay, if your sample size is 36. Note that I'm using this uh, 9.75 because it leaves 97.5% uh, to the left of this value, and it leaves the 2.5% that we are looking for to the uh, to the right of this value. Okay. And then whatever value you get here for the, the t value, you can be using the x bar, which is the sample mean that you have calculated before, plus or minus, because the plus or minus is for the lower bound and for the upper bound, the value, the t value, times the standard deviation, the sample, the estimated uh, sample standard deviation divided by the square root of x. So how this would look in reality? Now note that we have, again, the example about the American Economic Association who wants to construct the 95% confidence interval for starting salaries. They have the same uh, 36 uh, randomly selected graduates, and the average, again, is $48,500. But now assume that the population standard deviation is unknown. So before we said that population standard deviation is uh, 3,500. Now let's assume that you actually estimate based on those 36 uh, random graduates, you estimate the standard deviation to be 3,600. Okay. Note that now you have to leave the $48,500 plus or minus a T value of 2.03 times the 3,600 divided by the square root of 36. Okay? Note that this value of 2.03 leaves 2.5% in each tail of the T distribution with 35 degrees, degrees of freedom. Okay? So if you actually want to calculate this, so you can say, for example, QT, the probability of 0.975, and the degrees of freedom is equal to 35. And you see that you get the value of 2.030108. Okay? This is where this value here comes from. Okay? And very much like before, the value of $600 okay, is, which is 3,600 divided by the square root of 36, represents the standard error and the thousand two hundred eighteen dollars represents the so-called margin of error. So let's practice what we have just learned in constructing a confidence interval for the mean with unknown population variance. Let's use R for this exercise. Okay. For this exercise, we are going to use the data set MH2 which is the Meridian Hills 2 dataset, which contains 18 observations about the price of homes in the Meridian Hills uh, area. We have information about the number of beds, bed, bedrooms, bathrooms, and the square footage of the homes. Okay? The only thing, the only column we are going to use in this exercise is the price column. Okay? So in the first step, we are going to determine the number of observations that are actually in the in the data set Meridian Hills 2. Okay? Now we know that this is 18, okay? but in order to actually make our life a little bit, uh, make our life a little bit simpler, let us calculate this and we say that knobs or the number of observations, and you can use the command n row for this, the R command n row, you can say n row mh2. And note that you now have the value of 18 on the right-hand side. The second item that we need is actually the, the mean of the data. 
So let's call this mean data is equal to mean parenthesis open MH2 dollar sign price. So we see that the mean of our data set is $824,000, close to $825,000 actually. Okay. Now, the third item that we need is actually the estimated standard deviation. Okay. So now note that we can actually use the R function SD. I told you before in class that the SD function in R is actually using the n minus uh, n minus one to calculate the standard deviation. So in this case, we write uh, standard deviation equals SD parenthesis open MH two dollar sign price, and we see that the estimated standard deviation is five hundred twenty five thousand five hundred five hundred twenty two thousand uh, dollars. To construct or to determine the, the t value, which is consistent with the confidence interval that we want to construct, the 95% as well as the degrees of freedom, we say uh, t, let's just call it t value, equals qt, parenthesis open, 0.975, comma, and then we can just say knob. The number of observations minus one. And we can execute this, and we see that the t value is 2.1098. Okay? Note that if this, if we knew the population standard deviation, this would be a value of 1.96. Now, to calculate the upper bound, or to calculate the lower and the upper bound of the confidence interval, let's just call it CI lower bound, we take the mean of the data minus the T value times the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of observations. And so we get a lower confidence interval bound of $564,678. To construct the upper bound, the easiest way is we copy the previous line, call it upper, and we change the negative sign to a plus sign. And now we get the upper bound of 1.85 million dollars, basically. Okay. So now we have constructed a confidence interval for the mean of the housing values in the Meridian Hills area, and the lower bound of this confidence interval is uh, 500, approximately 565 thousand dollars, and the upper bound is about 1.08 million dollars. Now, you may think that this is a very complicated approach of actually calculating the confidence interval with R, and you are right about this, and so there's a much easier way. And to do this, you have to use the function t.test, and you simply type in mh2, dollar sign price, and you hit enter, and then you can see here, that you now have, it calculates automatically the 95% confidence interval of $565,000 as the lower bound and $1.08 million as the upper bound. And note that it also calculates the sample mean, which is 825, approximately $825,000. Okay. So this line, this line here, the T dot test, replaces the six lines that we have done here. Okay? But I still wanted to show you the mechanics of what actually happens when you calculate those, uh, when you are using the function uh, t dot test. Now note that in the future, when we're talking about hypothesis testing, that this t dot test will be a very important function that we are going to use uh, very often.
and so you see you will see that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of additional information here in the r output using the t dot test and we will get into the uh, we will get into the mechanics and what they all mean uh, very soon so this captures how we calculate the confidence interval for a mean now Calculating the confidence interval for a proportion or for a fraction is, uh, is much simpler. Note that for a proportion we have the following. We have the estimated proportion from the data, which we call uh, p hat. And it turns out that the estimated standard deviation is p hat times 1 minus p hat. And then you take the square root of that term. So the standard error for the proportion is, let's call this uh, sigma p hat, is the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat divided by n. The good thing about the confidence interval for a proportion is that we can actually use the standard normal for the, uh, to construct the 95% or 90 or 99 percent confidence interval and we say that the confidence interval for the proportion is p hat or whatever the estimated uh, estimated proportion is plus or minus 1.96 times sigma uh, sigma p hat so assume now as an example assume that you're interested in the political party affiliation of voters and you're sampling a thousand people and you find that 55% of the 1,000 people you sample are uh, Republican voters. So given the equation on the previous slide, you can now calculate the sigma p hat by taking 0.55 times the 0.45 divided by 1,000 and taking the square root. And this gives you the uh, 0 0.0157. Hence, if you calculate the margin of error for this, you have 0.55 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 0.0157. Note that if you calculate this term, that this is close to 3%. So what I want you to do, the next time you actually see any political poll on, the, on TV, think about, for example, um, uh, voters that is have to decide between uh, Biden versus Sanders, or that have to think about, that have to decide between uh, between Trump and uh, some uh, some Democratic candidate. That if the sample size is a thousand people, which very often it is, then the margin of error that should be indicated on TV or in the newspaper or online should be plus or minus three percent. Okay, this is where this margin of error comes from. Note that if the sample size declines, that this term here also gets larger, and hence the margin of error increases. Okay? So I have seen that I have seen um, polls uh, online that have a very wide margin of error of close to plus or minus five percent, and then when you actually look at the sample size, you realize that the sample size is sometimes around 500, okay? So it is a very, very small sample size, and hence you also have a very large margin of error. So before we get into the sample size calculations, let's actually uh, calculate a confidence interval for the proportion uh, by using R. Now in this case, we are going to use the general social survey, or data from the general social survey, and what we have here, so this is uh, this is actually also our real data. We have for 2018 whether a person was a full-time employee as opposed to part-time unemployed or temporary, whether a person worked for the government, whether a person was uh, married. Here we have a um, level of education, and we are not going to use uh, this column, but think about ranging from... Uh, no high school diploma, uh, all the way to graduate school. We have age of the person, the number of children, whether they voted in the 2016 election, and also uh, what their income was. 
And suppose that you're interested in calculating a confidence interval for uh, whether the person voted or not. So we are going to follow the following steps. We first calculate the number of observations that we have in the sample. We use the command nrow for that, and we say nrow gss. Then we find that the number of observations is 1,265 1, people. Then we calculate the mean of the data. And the mean of that data is uh, mean gss dollar sign vote. And we see that 68% uh, of the sample voted in the 2016 2016 election. Then we are going to use then we are going to calculate the z value and note that in this case we can actually use the the normal distribution. Actually, let me call this a z value, and we use the q norm, and we say 0.975. Remember from your homework that using the Q norm is when you actually have the area underneath the curve and you want to know the cutoff point. So here we know that this value is close to 1.96. So once you have those uh, values, you can also use the you can also determine the standard error. And the standard error is the square root of the mean data times 1 minus the mean data divided by n, or divided by the number of observations. And that value is 0 0.013. And to calculate the confidence interval, or the 95% confidence interval, we are using the lower bound. And that is the mean data minus z value times the standard error. Let's do it the upper bound as well. For the upper bound, we copy the above line and repla replace the negative sign with a positive sign. And now we have the confidence interval for the people who voted to be between the lower bound is um, about 66% and the upper bound is about 71%. Okay. Now again, this seems a lot of work to calculate the confidence interval. And of course, we can simplify those calculations significantly by using a built-in R function, which is called t-test. Again, the same as before. And all you do is you say t-test gss vote, you hit enter, and you now find that the 95% confidence interval with a, for a mean of 68.37%, uh, the lower bound is 65.81%, and the upper bound is 70.95%, okay? which is identical to the values we have uh, we have here on the right hand side. Okay, so now what we have seen before is that we take a sample, we know what the number of what the sample size is, or we can calculate the uh, the number of observations, and then based on the mean, based on the sample size we can then calculate what is called the margin of error. Right? This is what you see, say for example, the plus or minus 3% of whether a person is voting for one or one or the other candidate. Right? Now the question is, well, what if you are interested in actually a specific margin of error and you want to know what the required sample size is? This is where the sample size calculation comes in. Okay? Because we said before that the margin of error depends on the sample size, and it should be possible to calculate the sample size necessary to achieve a given margin of error. Now we are going to look at two possible cases. In one case, we assume an infinite population, 
Now note that in reality the population is not really infinite, but think about it as a very large population. And in one case you are thinking about a finite population. Okay. Then the equation to actually determine the sample size, if you're interested in the proportion, is that n, which is the sample size that uh, that is required, has to be bigger or e equal to z times Sigma divided by epsilon. And epsilon here, I call this the margin of error. And then you have to square it. Now, with the sample size calculation, if there's an infinite population, there can be two cases. First, you have a little bit of prior knowledge about the proportion. So think about the unemployment rate example that I have. Uh, given in class last time. If you're interested in how many people, or if the Bureau of Labor Statistics is interested in how many people are actually unemployed, then they have some sort of idea about the proportion. They know it's not going to be 50% of unemployment. They know it's not going to be 80% of unemployment. But they know it's going to be around, say, 5% of unemployment. So if they have prior knowledge about the proportion, then they can use this prior knowledge, say 5%. They can use this equation and plug in 5% as the p-value. Now suppose you have no idea about the proportion and you have to determine the sample size. So then we are in the second case and you actually have to plug in for the p-value. You're not plugging in the 5% the or your prior knowledge, but you're actually plugging in 0.5. The reason you're plugging in 0.5 is 0.5 actually corresponds to, let me call this the worst case scenario. If you plug in 0.5 in this equation here, you're getting the largest possible variance. So we can demonstrate this using R. So if you're typing in 0.5 times 0.5, you're getting a variance of 0.25. Compare this to the example that I said before, where we have prior knowledge and you are, say, suppose you think that the proportion is 0.05, then 0 0.05 times 1 minus 0.05 gives you a significantly smaller, gives you a significantly smaller variance. So plugging in the 0.5 makes sure that no matter what the population proportion, or what the sample proportion actually is, that you are going to be within a certain margin of error. Suppose that you want to know how many people support a property tax reform in Indianapolis. And suppose that you have absolutely no, no knowledge about the population parameters, but you want to be within 2%, or you want to have a margin of error plus or minus 2%. Because you have no knowledge about the population parameters, you are going to adopt the initial estimate that this is going to be 0.5 or 50 percent. Again, this is the result. This results in the worst case scenario. So, using the equations presented on the previous slides, you have the 1.96, which is the z value, times 0.5 divided by 0.02, where the 0.02 refers to the margin of error, to the desired margin of error. And you see that you have to estimate, or you have to ask at least. 2,401 people in order to be within 2.2 percent and to be within uh, plus or minus 2 percent. Okay. Now, using this example, I would like to highlight an important aspect here. Suppose that you think, well, why do I want a margin of error? Why can I not just estimate a model that reduces the margin of error to zero? So it turns out that this is not possible because you have the squared term. You have the squared term here. Okay, so what this means, what this squared term does is if you want to reduce your margin of error, say from 2% to 1%, then it is not sufficient to simply double your, uh, it is not sufficient to simply double your sample size but you actually have to grow it exponentially. Okay. So if you want to do, the, you, if you want to do this in a, 
uh, in R. Suppose you want instead of a sample size, instead of a margin of error of 2%, you want a margin of error of 1%. then it turns out that you have to ask 9,604 people, okay? What this means is you cannot simply redouble your sample size to half your margin of error, okay? Your sample size grows exponentially if you want to reduce your uh, margin of error, okay? Now, the sample size necessary also depends on the population size. Okay? Now, think about the elections in the United States or in any other country, and you ask people of who they are going to vote for. There are about 160 million uh, uh, registered, there are about 160 million eligible voters in the United States, which is very large. Okay? But suppose that you are interested in a survey on the IUPY campus and you want to know whether students support the privatization of the parking services. Note that this has been an issue or this has been a topic a couple of years ago. And assuming that you have no knowledge about how many students would actually support this and you want to be within uh, a margin of error of plus or minus 2%, note that this corresponds to the values I have presented on this slide. Okay. Then the equation for a finite population that you have to use is you first have to calculate the margin of error, uh, you have to calculate the sample size for an infinite population, and then you have to apply the formula presented on this slide, okay, where n is actually the population size. So note that the sample size for an infinite population is 2401. This is what we have calculated on the previous slide. And now assume that the university actually has 10,000 students. Then the n in this equation up here is 10,000. 10, so plugging in the 10,000 into the equation, what you see is that instead of asking 2,401 people, you now only have to ask 1,937 people, okay? Which makes sense because your population actually becomes smaller and uh, you do not have to ask as many people. Now, on the last two slides, you actually have the code of the uh, examples that I have given uh, previously about calculating the confidence interval for uh, Meridian Hills and also to calculate the confidence interval for the population proportion uh, using the voting data.